Hey, Crime Salad listeners, welcome back to another episode of Crime Salad, where we talk true crime. My name is Ashley. And I'm Ricky. And Ricky, are you ready to dive into the darkest corners of human nature? Do I have a choice? No. Then yeah. Okay. So this week, we are going to West Virginia, where Riley Crossman, a 15-year-old girl, vanished on Wednesday night, May 7, 2019. Riley was lying in bed, FaceTiming with her boyfriend, when a man she knew entered her room. Riley quietly texted her boyfriend and said that she was afraid and not to talk, but her boyfriend had fallen asleep. Whatever occurred soon after this text led to her disappearance. A careful and strong search where, eight days later, a body was discovered hidden in a rural location. In this episode, we will explore the police investigations that revealed the events leading up to this young girl's death and the fear and uncertainty that surrounded Riley Crossman's disappearance. Now, Riley, a 15-year-old girl growing up in the town located in Berkeley County, West Virginia, was raised by her mother, Chantel, and lived with her two younger brothers and her mother's boyfriend, Andy McCauley. Riley was known for her bright smile and even brighter personality. She was a friend, a dreamer, and was in her youth, innocently living her teenage years, going to high school, surrounded by friends, and her best friend was Jasmine, basically her sister from another mister. And they became close friends starting in middle school, and also Riley dated a kid from school named Hayden. She had a passion for singing and dancing, but everything quickly changed when Riley disappeared. On May 7th, 2019, the sun was up, the sky was clear, and everything seemed to be in place. On this day specifically, Chantel, Riley's mom, came home late from work and saw her boyfriend, Andy, sitting in a chair and noticed Riley's bedroom door was shut, but she didn't want to wake her because she was one busy girl. She needed all the sleep she could get, and so her mom, who was exhausted from working all day, went to bed. Now, in the morning, Chantel would normally be woken up by Riley, who would usually pop her head in her room and say, I love you, have a good day, and then she would leave for school. But on the morning of May 8th, that never happened. Not thinking much of it, she assumed that Riley walked herself to school as usual. So after Riley left for school, Chantel would get her two younger boys ready and drive them to school and then head to work. Chantel went on with her day, but things felt weird when the usual text from Riley weren't lighting up her phone throughout the day. Usually, with their busy schedules being that Chantel was working two jobs all day and Riley had school and friends, much of their communication was through text. Her mom said that she used emojis a lot in her text and described her as very emotional. So all day, no text came through from Riley. When Chantel came home, she found a message from the school that Riley was absent in one or more of her classes. So now the strange silence from Riley not texting and then this notification that she wasn't in school all day created this uneasiness that only grew more and more. Chantel called Riley's phone and it went straight to voicemail. Like we said, this 15-year-old girl was glued to her phone. There's no way she would just leave it uncharged. The rush of panic started to rise and Chantel called around to her friends, hoping to see if anyone has seen or heard from Riley. Her best friend Jamie hadn't heard from her and sent her a text, but it didn't go through. There was no recent post on any social media like Snapchat, which she used regularly. It just seemed that Riley vanished and no one had any clue where she went. Now, supposedly the school had a few classes where teachers had stated that Riley was in attendance. But after looking into this further, the school realized that wasn't true. Riley wasn't in school all day. Her family's initial confusion of her never returning home from school quickly turned into a frantic search, reaching out to friends and combing through the places she might be. The silence of the night was heavy. 
did this teenage girl sneak out of the house? Did she run away? Or did something happen to this 15-year-old girl? The family got to a point where they searched everywhere they could think of and found no sign of Riley. Authorities were called, receiving word that a 15-year-old girl, Riley Crossman, was missing. The need for help became even more pressing. Although the family was sure something happened, given her age, police chalked it up as a runaway at first. Friends of Riley's said that it was possible that Riley left the house because she was scared of Andy. Exactly what she was scared of wasn't very clear. Okay, so I want to interject here because when we first started going through this case and and listening to interviews and researching, it was very similar to the intro that we had in this episode, right? So we basically talk about Riley's mom. She's so hardworking. She worked multiple jobs. You know, we had interactions with Riley, those types of things, right? It all paints this very, you know, almost like hardworking mom, victim type, right? Mm -hmm. She does everything for her kids. I was just, you know, I'm, I'm listening to the story and I'm thinking, oh my God, that's horrible. I can't believe this happened to this family. But then my opinion started to change whenever we started watching interviews, uh, or not interviews, but body cam footage, like on YouTube. So the police come to the house, and I believe this is the first time that they were there, and you see two people. You see the mom, and then you see Andy, the boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Andy, the boyfriend, he's kind of leaned over on the side of the house or garage, and You know, he's kind of just looks like he's relaxing there. And then barefoot, smoking a cigarette, I think. And then you see the mom in the car. Now, I'm going to say two things. One, you know, Riley's mom, she could have definitely been a victim of addiction. She could have definitely been a victim of domestic abuse or whatever, bad influence, whatever you want to call it from the shitty boyfriend but she looks like she is just so high in the car right the police come up to the car she's kind of got her head down she doesn't really acknowledge that they're even around and andy's just kind of like standing there like your daughter is missing and again i give her all of the fucking credit in the world but like your daughter is missing at this point and you're not even making eye contact with the police even if you're addicted to drugs or whatever, like have the decency to be alert and say, this is the last time I saw her. This is whatever information that I can give anything to help your daughter. And I just did not see that from the mother or from Andy. And then obviously we know Andy is a piece of shit, but from the mother, I didn't expect that. And I know you have different feelings about the mother. So, you know, all hate mail directed towards me. But that's the vibe that I got. Now, I do agree with you that it, like whenever the police showed up, they both were kind of like, like stone faced. Who's like, going to step? Like who's going to step up? We can't really say this is how you would act if your daughter was missing. For all she knows, I mean, fifteen year old girl, she very well could have just ran away. I mean, I'll be honest. Whenever I was at that age, I would like sneak out of my house yeah. at night and just you did that to meet me. Yeah, like. But I guess my opinion here is that the police initially said, hey, she's 15. A lot of times, girls, boys, whatever of this age, very common that they run away. They'll come back, right? Like, maybe don't sound the alarms just yet. And that's what they were thinking at first. However, if I were a police officer in that situation, like how we saw the body cam, and I saw that scenario when I walked up, I think I'd be sounding some type of alarm to say, hey, reaching them back to the department or whatever to say, I'm getting weird feelings. Maybe this is more than what it, we think it could be. Yeah. Now, when we get to this next part, I want you to think about like what Ricky's saying, because it kind of makes you think like, is there more to this story than was ever mentioned? Because police, they step inside the house And they pull Andy aside and they say, hey, can you talk for a minute? Like, what's going on? Like, when's the last time that you saw Riley? And 
In the recorded footage, the police pull Andy aside and they say, hey, can you talk for a minute? What's going on? When's the last time you seen Riley? And he's explaining this to the police and I would give him maybe a two out of ten for his acting skills. Well, the police ask if they can go inside the house and take a look around. And when they enter her room, you know, this is a typical teenage room with clothes everywhere, laundry baskets filled, things all thrown across the room. Typical teenage room. Now, at first, things didn't seem all that alarming. Police were growing a little suspicious when they saw that her book bag was still there. And her mom's inside the room and she explains... She did leave her glasses. They're still here. She doesn't leave without them. She left her wallet here, her purse here. That's unlikely that she would leave without those things. Now, the supplies in her book bag were sprawled out across the floor. They weren't in the book bag. And that's because her brothers were looking through her things. Her mom was looking through her things, trying to find anything like a note, perhaps, that would say, hey, I'm leaving the house. Just anything, any sign of Riley, but nothing came up. So was this before the police came? They they were looking through her things? They were looking point? through her things because they were really thinking she must have ran away. Like something must have happened and she just took off. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. Now, one thing that they didn't find was her cell phone. And that cell phone was turned off. So all calls, all texts weren't coming through. So at this point, everyone thinks that she ran away. You know, but as they come through this messy room, the feeling of her running away on her own started to switch to something a little more severe once they found blood on her bed sheets and her pillowcase. Yeah, that's going to change some opinions. So the police found the blood, though, like the mom didn't. From the police body cam footage, the mom never said, hey, there's blood all over her bed. But she was in the room looking through all the stuff. Like, you don't notice blood on the wall or or anything like that? Yeah, she never brought it up. Ah, that's suspicious. Now, there wasn't a massive amount of blood, but there was enough that you could see that she was bleeding from her nose and her mouth. Like, on the pillowcase, that almost looked like an exact print from a nose, like two nostrils in the same position, and also where the mouth would be. Hmm. And it was enough that you would say she probably was struck in the face because of the imprints of the blood and the amount of the blood. And later on, they actually find saliva in this blood. Mm, That's not good. So with the combination of her missing and finding this blood all over her bed, this was more than just a runaway. And the police also found droplets of blood along the door frame. These blood samples were taken in for DNA profiling. And while their investigation continued, her disappearance was known throughout the community. Everyone was on their feet, ready to do whatever it took to find her. The search efforts kicked off with a sense of urgency. A mix of law enforcement and volunteers joined together, holding on to hope that she was okay. Days into Riley's disappearance, there were flyers being posted on telephone poles and being shared. There were search parties and social media blasts, and even the local coffee shop owner kept the doors open late for volunteers. There were local kids who organized bake sales for the search fund. This effort was more than just a mission to find her. It was a profound statement where the entire community came together with the same mission. I always find it really cool, like, these small towns, like, coming together. It's like you can almost feel the love and support throughout the entire community. Like, that is just, like, on another level of of what Riley, you know, means. Mm. Because this girl is missing, and she came from this family, and no one knew Riley from the beginning, but it brought everyone together. And I think it's one of those things where, you know, like we've lived in big cities, we've lived in tiny little towns, and in a big city, it's just another, you know, headline. It's just another title to a a, a news article that came out. But like in small towns, it's like they really feel it, you know, it echoes throughout the community. And that's exactly what happened in this town. 
Volunteers teamed up with law enforcement. So they covered every inch of the town and surrounding areas. There were drones buzzing all over town and over dense forests and boats coming through the rivers. The community's heart was in this together. Each person held on to hope, refusing to let despair take root. Now, police worked diligently piecing together evidence up to this point that led them to a possible homicide. There were hours invested into viewing security camera footage from nearby businesses, and there was a local bank who also provided footage, being that her phone was shut off and there were no cell phone pings. But this was all strange because this is a 15-year-old girl who was glued to her phone. As any teenager would be. Now, like we said, Riley's cell phone wasn't found during their search, and they looked at her cell phone pings, which didn't show anything because the phone was off, which, like we said, was unusual. This is a teenage girl who was glued to her phone and always had it charged. Now, police, they wanted to see the text messages of conversations they had with Riley before she went missing. They also spoke with everyone in her family, and everyone's stories matched. Then there was Andy McCauley. Things got interesting when they spoke with him. Going back to the body cam footage, that is when they first spoke with Andy McCauley, and he was casually explaining the last time he saw Riley. He was stumbling over his words, explaining that all the kids were in bed by 9, 9.30, And he woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning and he left for work around 5 a.m. And he was at work all day long. However, police spoke with a co-worker of Andy's and he said that he usually would have to bang on the door to try to wake Andy up to go to work. But on this particular day, Andy was ready for work. He was actually calling him on the phone saying, hey, are you ready? Come and pick me up. I'm ready. Let's go. He was basically in a rush to get to work. So this was a coworker that gave Andy a ride in the morning. But he's saying that, like, it was actually kind of weird because Andy was ready for work. He was ready to go. But normally he was, like, calling him, trying to wake him up, trying to get him, you know, in the car to give him a ride to work. Yeah. Every day before work, this coworker would come to pick him up. Mm, okay. But on this particular day, Andy was ready to go. And he was in a rush to get to work on time. The unusual behavior was noted by police as they continued their look into Andy. Now, one thing that didn't match up was that Andy's coworker and even Chantel, his girlfriend, would say that he was actually missing from work. And he was gone for about four to five hours. During his work day, he was just missing? Yeah. So like he said, he was at work all day long. However, he actually wasn't. He actually wasn't. Hmm. Where was he? Bathroom. And after the police questioned him with this little inconsistency, he excitedly agreed. Oh, oh, yeah. I was at this other place. Yeah. I forgot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, and he even apologized. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Totally slipped my mind. I was actually, yep. I was gone four to five hours, actually. Um, mm Mm-hmm. And then this slightly turned into a confession that he was buying drugs. Well, you caught me. Looks like I was buying drugs during four to five hours of time I should have been at work. Sorry, you should probably arrest me for that or charge me. And But don't charge me for anything else. No. <laughs> and he continued to change up his story like three or four times, giving investigators a hard time to believe his so-called alibi. And not to mention, he left his cell phone at home on this day. How convenient. So like we said, the police rely heavily on surveillance footage in this case. And they're looking at businesses and they're looking at a local school. And while looking at the school's surveillance footage, they see this green Dodge Ram truck zooming past, specifically with a ladder on the back that looked identical to the truck that he was driving around 8.15 a.m. Then they're following the timeline with another business along that route, a bank, which captured his truck driving by, which made sense and gave investigators confidence that he was heading towards Berkeley Springs, which 
is where Riley would be located inside her house. And sure enough, another business provided detectives with surveillance footage, which was a Shell gas station in Hedgesville, West Virginia. This is about a half mile to a mile away from the bank. And he was actually caught on another surveillance camera walking into a gas station, paying for gas and nothing else. This was like a quick walk in, walk out, money exchange. Like he threw money on the counter and just left. Like pump one. Now from this last location of him walking into this gas station, police were left at a standstill. They were like, we don't know what else to look at. We have no other footage. There's nothing for us to look at. So... They were kind of at this roadblock. That's so funny. was this during business hours, though? Because, I mean, he said, hey, I worked the entire day, you know, and then obviously eventually he said, oh, OK, I was gone four or five hours or whatever. Was this during like when he should have been working? Yes. So good point. This is basically confirming you were not work the entire time. We caught you on surveillance footage. We got you. You were lying. Yeah. yeah. OK. Wow. But what's really cool about this is they had to sort through so much footage. Like, I worked at a bank, and I had to do that for, like, little tiny cases. Like, I couldn't imagine because there would be, like, hours of footage you would have to sort through. Like, you would search for that time. So, like, 8.15, he started. So, you would kind of be in that time frame. So, what were you? You were, what, a fraud analyst, Yeah, basically. So, you had to find out, like... When someone ripped the bank off some money or something, you would find out it was like some dude with a cane who like made a big scene and talked a lot. Yeah. Little side story. Normally the people would come in with like a cast or like something to be like, oh, like pity, like a pity story. Poor guy. Yeah. But then it's like, oh my gosh, that's the guy who did the fraud right there. I remember how excited you were. You're like, I I think I figured it out. (laughs) I missed that job. That was so much fun. That was a cool job. Yeah, but you used to cry every day, so I don't know. True. So basically, they were tracking him from the local businesses, creating a timeline of where he was going, and then the police were at a standstill. So basically, this debunks any type of alibi that he tried to create. Yeah, exactly. Then there was an eyewitness, Denise Dever, who was Andy's ex-girlfriend, who described that she saw a green Dodge Ram truck backing up at Riley's residence and parking far back, like in between the house and the shed. Kind of an unusual spot if you were backing a truck up into, like right at the back door. Denise saw this happen, and she said that the driver's side door was open while he backed up, but she has no other information. She just happened to see this happen during this exact time. Then there was Riley's boyfriend who gave the police a look into their conversation through text on that Wednesday that Riley was last seen. So did he go to the police because they didn't have her cell phone, so they couldn't have found records? Did he just say, hey, I was talking to her and then she went dark, basically? It seemed that they were on FaceTime during the evening and Riley texted Hayden, her boyfriend, Andy's in my room. Don't say anything about it. He can hear everything. She then texted, I'm scared, babe. It seems at this point that Hayden fell asleep. So he never got these text messages. He went to school the next day. In the morning, he saw the last text that showed up on his phone, babe. And he just deleted them and went on with his day. He went to school. And when he came home, he found these messages on his Apple Watch. Hayden texted her phone, where are you? And she didn't respond. And then he texted in all caps, Riley. Hayden, not getting a response and also not seeing her in school that day, takes his watch to his parents and they go straight to the police. And supposedly at this time, Hayden logged into Riley's Instagram page to see what was going on. And he noticed that everything was deleted. And he claims that he didn't do it. Off her Instagram? Yeah. That's weird, though, because... If Andy did do it, how did he know her login? It's kind of like a weird thing that happened, but it was brought up in court. Oh, actually, he wouldn't need to know her login if he had her phone, right? He would just hit the Instagram app, icon, whatever. That's true. Could you imagine, though, like Hayden? I mean, they were on FaceTime together. He had fallen asleep. But then 
this happen. Like he was asleep for it. So he wasn't able to like see what was happening or, or report it to anybody. But like, wow, like they were connected on a line when whatever happened, happened. Yeah. Nuts. I am kind of confused about the Instagram scenario because Andy, he was so surprised about these text messages when the detectives brought it up. He was like, what? That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, if he's checking Instagram, you think he would have checked text messages. Also. Yeah, like why would he log into the Instagram and just go, so happened to delete everything? It's kind right. of weird. But he could have also been high. <laughs> but it was just kind of one of those weird things that they brought up in court, so I thought I'd add it. <laughs> so yeah, so Andy explained why she would text this. Why was there blood all over her room that came back matching to Riley's DNA and showed an extreme act of violence and why did you skip out on work on May 7th, 2019? Good question. To note, police reported that blood was found in her room and it was mixed with saliva, as we mentioned earlier. So it makes you think that Riley could have been beaten in the face or the head to have blood from her mouth or her nose. And that was on the pillow, correct? Yeah. So they're thinking she's like face down in this pillow. Yeah, and it's believed that she suffocated, but they never like, confirmed that or anything. It's just kind of their way of analyzing it and thinking that's what happened. I don't know. I don't know. This guy's dumb because, like, if you committed a crime, like, if you went to go hide her body, you didn't do anything about the blood that you left behind. That's true. Like, why are you, why are you leaving a pillowcase with blood all over it and blood on the wall? Yeah, do a, do a walkthrough. Like, you literally took her body and moved it as we'll talk about later but like you put the effort into hiding and concealing this murder that happened in her bedroom right but i think the key difference here between this and in other cases that we often do is that none of this was premeditated in a sense yeah true and it seems that this was all an act based on opportunity with a mix of being under the influence with something so how old was andy during all of this He was 43 years old, and just a reminder, Riley was only 15. Yeah, gross. On May 15th, Riley's mom, Chantel, did this secret recording with just him and her where she demanded that he give her a timeline. She points out in this recording that the police know it's him who did something to her daughter. And until he can basically be ruled out, she doesn't know what to believe. She breaks down into tears matched with this feeling of not knowing what to do, what would make her want to leave the house. She says in this recording, I don't want to accuse you. I'm just trying to make sense of all this. And her tone is very worrisome. She has had enough at this point. It's been over a week and her daughter's phone has been off. The tensions are rising. And with the strong suspicion surrounding Andy, it's hard to believe at this point he doesn't have something to do with her leaving the house. Now, the very next day after Chantel did this secret recording, Chantel's life would be filled with terrifying, horrible news. A body was discovered. With the hours of dedication from the police department viewing all of the surveillance video footage from nearby businesses, they basically were able to track Andy's movements. Investigators were convinced that on Wednesday, when he initially said that he was working all day, he had left the job site and drove to the house, and that he had placed Riley's body in the back of his truck bed at some point. Thanks to the amazing cadaver dog, Rock, he was able to identify that there was decomposition in the back of that truck at some point. Without the dedication and skilled law enforcement officers and thinking outside the box, who knows if this case would have been solved today. One of the biggest contributors in this case was the timeline of the surveillance footage. However, there was a point in the surveillance timeline that they were left at a standstill. So it took a little of -of out-of-the-box thinking. An officer who visits a small convenience store regularly asked to check the surveillance video footage just to check that off. And wouldn't you know it, a green Dodge Ram truck the same truck that they had been following within the timestamps of all of the different surveillance videos was captured. 
Then a nearby residential home that had a security camera captured the same truck driving past. And within a short amount of time, like about 19 minutes, his truck was seen driving back in the opposite direction. So whatever he did, wherever he went, it all took approximately 19 minutes from when he was seen again. So putting all the pieces together, police felt it was a clear indication that he disposed of Riley's body somewhere in this area. This road that he was driving on would be described as a back road that drives up a mountain-like hill. This is a very rural area with a bunch of greenery and trees. It's a woodsy area, and there would be only a few reasons why someone would be driving along this road, like if you lived there or you're driving into the next town. Well, I mean, what other reason would Andy be going out that way, right? Like, he didn't have a destination. To me, this seems like a good place to dump a body. Yeah, and it would be eight days after Riley went missing when a team of officers searched the proximity of this location. Now, the area, like we said, this was a remote area covered in trees and nature. There were parts where steep cliffs or ledges would be located. So although the mission was to find Riley, it was also important to keep everyone safe as well even the cadaver dogs who were brought on to help with the search. So I think it's interesting here because we have the camera footage. So I, it gives us this, this information that we wouldn't have had without it. So I, I think he was gone like 19 minutes later, he was like being seen driving in the opposite direction now from mm-hmm. that destination. So I think there's conclusions that could be made there for the police. The police could say, okay, it was only 19 minutes. He probably didn't have a lot of time to like go really deep into the woods, you know? So that first place you could look was probably right off the road, something like that. There also wasn't a lot of time to dig, you know, this crazy deep grave site. So, you know, maybe this was something they're going to see some fresh dirt something that's not very deep. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of information that you have because of this footage that I think probably could, I don't know, make the search quicker or, um, you know, kind of narrow it down. Yeah, that doesn't give you a lot of time. 19 minutes. I don't think I could even dig a hole in that amount of time and be out. Can't even brush your teeth in 19 minutes. No. I've counted. Now, the officers on the scene... I feel like they had the same idea in mind. There were different officers who searched different areas, and they were on a mission, confident in the clues they had pieced together. As an officer was driving, checking his surroundings along the road, he noticed a group of birds flying up in the sky along with a smell of decomposition. Once the officer got out of the car and looked into an embankment along the road, he spotted a body. And because of the decomposition, it wasn't immediately confirmed to be Riley. After comparing pictures of Riley in her clothes, they made a more confident decision that it appeared to be Riley Crossman. Stumbling upon a body in this condition would be burned into your mind. The thought of throwing a young girl into an embankment like unwanted trash is disgusting. Not to mention a young girl who you were to be a parent figure for. And the thought of what he probably did moments before she died is sickening. While he sat there with Riley's mom, playing this innocent character, eight days leading up to finding her decomposing body that has been taken over by wildlife and was left to never be found and to rot away. Thinking of that makes me so mad. Like, the day before this all happened, he sat there and looked into Chantel's eyes, claiming he was innocent all while she had every reason to believe he had something to do with her disappearance. And what had to have hurt more was she thought she left the house. In that recording, she was saying, why would she just leave? So this would be just a moment where your entire world would be flipped upside down. Yeah, I mean, you're never thinking of the worst case scenario here, at least with a teenager, you're assuming she'll come back. Yeah, she's going to show up at some point. Yeah. And I know we didn't get to the part where he was found guilty, but we already know. Just look at all the circumstantial evidence surrounding this case. In this same area where Riley was found, 
an officer noticed a few screws that were found near her body. And these were a small style hex shaped bolt like screw with a washer attached. And these same screws were found inside the bed of the truck that Andy was driving around. And I think the interview that we saw, you know, the lady who had the cadaver dog, she mentioned also like she saw these screws in the bed when they were actually doing the search with the cadaver dog. So it's like, it's really cool with that attention to detail to say, okay, like we've seen these screws now at the crime scene, but we also saw them in the truck and that that kind of pulls the two together. Yeah, that's like a crazy attention to detail. Yeah. And so it was days later after her disappearance, over an embankment, a body was found and the remains were brought into the state medical examiner's office on May 17th, 2019. Dental records were used to confirm the identity, and sure enough, it was a confident match. Riley Crossman was dumped over this embankment. She was found with a tribal-type designed shirt that was pulled over her head, and she didn't have a bra on. She had one red untied shoe that looked like a Keds-style shoe. She was wearing jean shorts that were unbuttoned and unzipped. And it was described by the medical examiner that they were hiked up as if someone carelessly yanked them up, possibly after she was deceased. Now, because of the decomposition, it wasn't possible to determine the exact cause of death. But it was determined that the cause of death was homicidal violence. Andy McCauley willingly came in for questioning. A West Virginia state police officer questioned him multiple times about his journey from Hedgesville to Berkeley Springs. Andy claimed that he traveled on State Route 9 back, but later he changed his version of events to say that he took another route near Route 9 to avoid construction. He denied having been on Tuscarora Pike or Apple Harvest Drive that year. And when her body was first found, it was reported that she was on top of a contractor garbage bag and that there was a white, chalky substance that was believed to be drywall mud. Which makes sense. In the back of the work truck that was believed to be the vehicle used to move the body, there's white stuff all through the back of the truck. And also, their number one suspect worked for a construction company. And a few other things that make sense. While on a work site, the construction company owner mentioned that Andy asked for a few trash bags so he could clean up the site. So again, I mean... Everything's just pointing at Andy. The evidence is just piling up at this point. Yeah. It sure is. And I think this is a good example, though. We've covered a lot of cases that were, you know, they were preemptive. But this one, you can tell, is like reactive. They didn't have time to to really think through the crime. You know, it was something that I believe probably happened on accident. And now he's just scrambling to clean up evidence and and get rid of the body yeah and that body just so happened to be found on tuscarora pike which was where he denied ever being and they had camera footage evidence of him driving that way and driving back yep so on november 4th 2021 the courtroom was filled and prepared for an intense week with the jury taking their time deliberating for about four hours across two days before landing on their verdict. This case involved an innocent minor, so as you can tell, this would have been a roller coaster of emotions and revelations. Riley's devastated family spoke, her friends who missed her dearly, and experts who pieced together the haunting puzzles of her last days. The prosecution didn't hold back pointing to DNA evidence that painted out all the details leading to Andy McCauley as the murderer, highlighting the emotional wreckage left in the wake of Riley's death. On the flip side, the defense honestly didn't have much to work with. They tried to question the motive, but that didn't get them anywhere. Now, Andy McCauley is staring down the barrel of a life sentence. The jury reached a verdict of murder in the first degree. The judge read this aloud and also added that a murder in the first degree is without mercy, which requires the judge to sentence the defendant to prison without being eligible for parole. So if it was with mercy, then in 15 years or so of incarceration, the inmate might be eligible for parole. 
but that decision would be made during that time. So basically, F this dude. He's a piece of who? Yeah. Just like he gave no mercy to Riley Crossman, he doesn't get any mercy either. Heck him. It's believed that on the morning of May 8th, Andy kept Riley's body hidden inside her room until everyone left the house. He, too, leaving for work in the morning. Then he came back to the house with the work truck, and this is where he put her in the back of the truck. He used the contractor garbage bags from work and set off to the dump site location where Riley was eventually found. Andy still claims his innocence and pleads not guilty. Of course he does. Even after the text Hayden received from Riley's phone, that she is so scared. Even after traces of decomposition were found in the work truck that he was driving around the day she went missing. With the way the blood was found on her pillow, it's a possibility that she was beaten and suffocated with her face in the pillow to mute her cries for help. The pattern on the pillow showed that there was blood coming out of her mouth and her nose, and it also contained saliva. This was an adult male who most likely sexually assaulted this young teen and carelessly dumped her body in the brush. And because her friends knew that she was scared of Andy before this ever happened, makes you wonder if this was the first time that this has happened. Yeah, no way. And we can go on and on. And to quote Ricky, Andy is a piece of poop. Yep. Heck him. Before this all happened... He had trouble with the law, like he had cocaine on him, he got caught selling it, he had assault charges, burglary charges. He's kind of a piece of poop from the very beginning. Perhaps one of the most significant impacts of Riley's story has been the strengthening of the community bonds. The outpouring of support for Riley's family and the unified search efforts served as a powerful reminder of what communities can achieve when they come together. It's prompted many to volunteer to get to know their neighbors better and participate more actively in community safety. Riley's story, while marked by tragedy, has also become a tapestry woven with memories, hopes, and the relentless pursuit of justice and safety for all. It's a reminder that behind every headline, there's a human story with the power to change the world in profound ways. As we reflect on Riley Crossman's story, we're reminded of the fragility of life and the strength of the human spirit. Her legacy is not just in the sadness of her loss, but in the countless ways her story has inspired change, brought people together, and highlighted the importance of vigilance and community in protecting the most vulnerable among us. In remembering Riley, we do more than just look back. We carry forward her light in our ongoing efforts to make our community safer, more connected, and ever vigilant. Let's honor her memory by being a little kinder, a little more aware, and a lot more united in our shared humanity. I have to say, at the beginning of the episode, I wasn't really on the mother's side. You know, I, w- I was disappointed in a, a couple of different things, some of the, the body cam footage that we saw. But, you know, at the end of this episode, they're all victims to Andy. You know, yeah. Andy's Andy, the monster. He is. And it sucks that we live in a world where monsters exist. Yeah. And, you know, she probably thinks back to sitting in the same room, looking into his eyes and being like, what happened? Like, I know you know something. Like why? And he's just denying and denying and claiming his innocence and her thinking back like, oh, my God, like, how could he have done something to her? Yeah. Like, what did he do to her? Yeah. It's just. It's easy to be naive. Yeah, it is. You would never think that someone you brought into your home, like a new boyfriend. You've loved, you've trusted. Yeah. Could be a monster. Who sits there and talks to your kids at the dinner table would turn on the whole family like that that's just disgusting sucks i think that completes this week's episode i do too make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening so like if you're listening on spotify subscribe or apple subscribe also we've had a ton of people reach out it seems like a lot of you are excited that we're going to crime con oh my gosh i am so stoked it's gonna be cool like, we've never... Well, we met someone at a Dairy Queen. 
very yes. randomly. That Are you was- Ashley and Ricky from Crime Sound? I'm like, only because we were both wearing Crime Sound t-shirts. But I am so excited to meet you guys in person. I know. And Tennessee, like Nashville, Tennessee, Nashville, to top it off. Tennessee. Going to be awesome. We can't wait to see you guys there. You know, those of you who are going. We also have merch on our site. So if you want to represent our show, grab some merch. Yeah. Crimesalad.shop. Also, make sure you give us a five-star review. I've seen a lot of reviews lately, and a lot of them talk about me. They're like, oh my God, Ricky's talking? I like the comment about the drunk uncle. <laughs> Maybe that. that was a Facebook uh, message, but uh, whatever. You know, I'll take it. <laughs> All right. We will see you guys next week. See ya. See ya.